Are we having fun yet? All right, that's the main thing. All right, while you check that tuning, I'm going to set this up. It's a very special clinic on a lot of fronts. First of all, I don't think in our 10 years, I know in our 10 years in L.A., we've not had a Nashville bass player. And I've killed uh, all the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> They're dead. <laughs> so we're thrilled about that, especially because right now Nashville always seems to be where it's at. But then there's a lot of history with this gentleman, and that is that the very first bass event we did, which was in 1997 in New York when it was called Bass Day, and that was at SIR on 54th Street, no longer there. And we started this idea of a base event. And somehow, Dave Pomeroy was on that. I forgot the story of how you got on there, but came up from Nashville and then was just the spirit of the event, got the jam going. Uh, if you don't know about Dave, not just the top level Nashville session bass player, but the president of the Nashville Musicians Union. He's got a great new album, Angels in the Ashes, and I see more. He's got great bass videos. He's got the bass orchestra. So let's give it up for a very special visitor this year, Dave Pomeroy. Oh, man. Thank you, Chris. Well, wow, thanks. It's, it's an honor to be here. Appreciate you guys being here. And I got to say, Bass Player Magazine. I remember when there was no Bass Player Magazine, and bass players would look in the back of Guitar Player for little crumbs of, of knowledge or insight, you know, once every nine issues or something, you know, and, and, and you know, and I, uh, we, we have a magazine with the union, and I know that the print world is not the easiest thing to deal with, so kudos to you, Chris, for keeping it going, and, uh, you know, and what, a, what an amazing event, uh, 18 years, I'm not sure, I must have been Rip Van Winkle there at some point or something, but... Uh, I'm, I'm just really grateful to, to have the opportunity to come out here, and, and bass player was really good to me. It started, started with a guy named Richard Johnston, who wrote for the magazine and had lived in Nashville for a while. In fact, he was an ex-roommate of a buddy of mine uh, there, and he started reviewing some albums that I was playing on, and uh, one thing led to another, and I, um, it, it, uh, I ended up co-writing a song. This is the first song I'm going to play here for you that... Uh, uh, Jim Roberts heard it, who was the editor at the time, and he went, hmm, this guy's pretty crazy. And so they, they did a piece uh, about me that kind of put me on the map in the bass world. And, and this song was brought to me by a wonderful songwriter named Guy Clark uh, from Texas. And he was at the Kerrville Folk Festival one year, and he ran into a young lady named Emily Cates, who had written this song. And he said, he called me up in a very serious voice, you need to come over. I need to play you a song. You know, Guy Clark is not a song plugger. You know, he's like a poet. And so I went over and he played me this song and it just blew my mind. So I took it and I messed with it and I added some stuff and I took some stuff out and I did a crazy recording with about 25 bass parts. And uh, so I'm always grateful to both Emily and Guy and I got to give them both credit for this. So, um, and it goes like this. Ooh. Oh, yes. It does not go like that. It goes like this. <laughs> Change was subtle and the mood was low key. The sky was overcast, you couldn't hardly see. But the creatures all slid down to a slower frequency. The day of the bass players took over the world. We came pouring out of symphonies, orchestras and bands, and every other kind of combo ever known to man. And although it was spontaneous, you'd think it was planned when the bass players took over the world. One day the bass players decided to uprise We're tired of being side man to all those other guys So we kidnapped the horn section Spiked the drummer's drinks And tied up the guitar players With them big old flat wound strings Yes we did Except Dwayne Eddy Cause he always played real low when we liked that Thank you. 
One day the bass players decided to uprise. Tired of being stepped on by all that techno jive. So we erased the memories of all those drum machines and locked away the keyboards and the sampling things. Now this is where I usually go into the whole story about how the bass player is making everybody feel good and next time you find yourself dancing you should go thank the bass player and all that but I'm preaching to the choir so I don't have to do that. And so the world was finally set free. The animals all hung out and interacted fretlessly. And the air began to vibrate with such a deep Tonality. The day the bass players took over the world. The day the bass players took over the world. The bass players are taking over the world. Yeah. Think about it. Could it get any worse? I got 2020 vision. The day the bass players took all over the world yeah maybe give me just a little less there I'm kind of hearing the monitors rattle there just a little bit all right so it's great to be here I'm uh, I'm very honored to be part of this what an incredible collection of of uh, people here, you know, it's just like you turn the corner, it's like, wow, there's an icon, there's another icon, and somehow I got into this, so very happy to be here. Um, so I'm going to kind of play, and I'm going to talk, and, and, and anybody can stop me at any point if you got a question, just raise your hand, and I'll shut up, and you can talk, so that'll be fine. Um, so I'm going to just kind of talk about how, how I got here. Um, influences and inspirations, you know, everybody has those and you know it's exciting to think that you came up with something brand new that's never been done before and but it came from somewhere and there's a chain that's been going on for a long time and the bass is a relatively young instrument so we we have the ability to change history a little more than some of the other uh, instruments of the world and uh, so I was a military kid I was born in Italy and when I was five years old in 1961 we moved to London England uh, and we lived around England for the next four years while my dad was, was there. And uh, about 19, mid-1962, on the telly, as they call it over there, was this amazing thing happening with these guys running around with long hair and playing music and jumping around and girls screaming. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. But I was six years old, so I didn't really put it together that that could actually be a job. That never occurred to me at all. But uh, we moved back to the States. I was about eight years old. Played a little bit of piano, a little bit of clarinet, and when I was 10, they started a school orchestra. And I somehow got in my head I wanted to play the cello. I don't know what, what I think it said rhyme with jello, I think was what it was. I don't know. And, and so I said, well, we already have a few cello players, and you have big hands, so maybe you should play the bass. And I'm like, okay, what's a bass? And there it was over in the corner, and it was oh, that moment, and I've been in love with the bass ever since. You can ask any of my ex-wives. And there's a story about that uh, later. Uh, <laughs> so I was about 13, 12 or 13, when I figured out that this was that. And in Paul McCartney's case, that. And the first guy who really just blew my mind and was Jack Bruce. It was like, because he was singing, he was writing the tunes, and he was essentially leading the band. And and because they were a trio, you could separate. You know, with the Beatles, it was like an oil painting. It was just this incredible, they were such an entity. I couldn't do that. But with Cream, it was like, wow, man, listen to that. And that live version of Spoonful, 16 minutes and 44 seconds of E. I played along with that thing till my parents just went nuts. I reckon. And so Jack was really the, the first guy to make me go, that's what I want to do. John Entwistle, Chris Squire, I was always a big fan of, of the British guys, not just because we lived there, just that, that music spoke to me. And as I got a little older, I started getting into, uh, you know, progressive rock, which kind of led me to jazz. And as I did with bluegrass music later on, you hear the new stuff, and then you start going backwards. And so I discovered Charlie Mingus, and he blew my mind, because that was like, wow, everything. I mean, and... 
Uh, his music was very inspiring to me. And then uh, after two years of college, I started playing, in my second year of college, I started playing in a band, and, and it was, uh, I was actually making money playing music. And it was like, what am I doing in college? My parents at that time were at NATO headquarters in Belgium. And I looked at a map and I went, hmm, England's not that far away. So I went over for my summer vacation and announced that I was quitting school and then my grade showed up and that pretty much sealed the deal. And, and so I said, yeah, great, I'm going to London to be a rock star, which way's north? And, uh, and after they pulled my dad out of the ceiling, uh, eventually, he, a couple months later, he gave me a ride to London with a bass and an amp and my stuff. And I, and I knew one guy that I had met in Belgium whose parents were in the British military. So it was uh, September of 1976, and you know I wanted to be in King Crimson, prog rock land, you know. And, I, and the day I got there was the day that the Sex Pistols went on TV and caused a big stir and cussed at everybody. And suddenly, what I wanted to do was not fashionable at all. So it was very interesting. But I got there on a Wednesday, uh, bought a music paper, got an audition the next day, got the gig. Friday night, watched the first, uh, for, watched the old bass player do his. Uh, last gig, and then Saturday night played my first gig. Monday morning, went to the immigration office and said, "How do I get a work permit? I'm I'm going to live in England the rest of my life." And I was just such a pain to those guys that they eventually gave me a work permit, even though the band that I joined originally had already split up. But I managed to live there for for a year, a year to the day, and it was a wonderful experience. Um, and I made a lot of friends that I still have to this day. And and uh, England has always been kind of an interesting part of my life. And um, so a, a singer that I had worked with in college um, had moved to Nashville, Tennessee. So kind of like when I moved to London, I knew one person. So I thought I'd check it out. So 40 years and one month ago, I moved to Nashville. And, uh, but while I was in London, I went to a concert and I saw a guy named Eberhard Weber, German bass player, playing this weird uh, electric stand-up bass at the... Uh, uh, the Royal Vic, the Victoria Concert Hall, and he was fronting the band. Again, bass player leading the band. And it was uh, phenomenal. And the tone was like, it was beautiful. It was a trombone sound almost, and I was intrigued with that. And I, I bought all his records, and I really just became a huge fan of what he was doing. And so I, I moved to Nashville, and uh, a few years later, I looked in the back of Guitar Player Magazine, and a guy named Harry Fleischman had an ad in there for this. And I saw that picture, and I called him and said, have you ever heard of Eberhard Weber? He says, yeah. I, don't, I still don't know if he was <laughs> telling me the truth or not. I said, can you play something for me over the phone? And he played a few notes. I'm like, okay. And at that time, I was on the road with a singer named Don Williams. And so um, we were, he was, Harry was in Colorado at the time, and he brought a bass to my hotel room, and I played, and I went, oh, my God, that's the sound. That's what I want. And I went to Don because I already had a family going, and I was, you know, we were doing okay, but it wasn't like there was an extra few thousand dollars laying around, and Don loaned me half the money to buy it, and I bought this thing in 1982, and uh, been beating it up ever since, and uh, boy, I got some looks back in the day, being on the road with a country artist, be like, uh, what is that? I mean, is that a bass? Yes, it's a bass. I've, at one point, I thought I'd just get a little card that I could hand to people when they would ask me that stuff. And I still, still, you know, and even the low B at the time was, was disturbing to many people. Uh, you know, I remember an engineer coming in and going, man, what's, what are you doing? I'm like, playing the bass. How you doing? And so it was interesting to see. And then a few years later, it actually became my calling card. I played it on a record by a guy named Keith Whitley. And at that time, string bass had disappeared from Nashville. So... Um, and in terms of recording. And so I was not thinking I'm going to put jazz into country music. I was just thinking, wow, you know, I'd like to, you know, I think this is a way to kind of get back to that sound. And I had, there was one moment in that song uh, called I'm No Stranger to the Rain when I did this big slide from here to here. And all of a sudden my phone started ringing. I couldn't believe it. So, and I played this on a lot of records with a bunch of folks. Amy Lou Harris calls it the bass from space. Be sure to bring the bass from space, Dave. It's like, yes, ma'am. I'll do whatever you want me to do, Emmy Lou Harris. And she, we're still good friends. She's an awesome lady. So I'm going to do a song for you here that um, was uh, written by Guy Clark and his wife, Susanna, and Richard Dobson. I played on Guy's version of this. And, um, and Emmy actually sang the harmony. And uh, so I recorded this on my second uh, record, Tomorrow Never Knows. And... Uh, 
it's uh, it's just it's it's. It's just a, it's a, it's a great lyric, and what I've learned, and we'll talk about it some more in a minute. Uh, it's just you know, as Poncho said, it's all about the song. And if the song says "Go nuts," you go nuts. And if the song says "What's going on," then you know, pay attention. And uh, so this is this is called "Old Friends." It's like when you're making conversation And you're trying not to scream And you're trying not to tell them you don't care what they mean and you're really feeling fragile but you know you can't get home and you really feel abandoned but you want to be alone old friends shine like diamonds old friends you can always call old friends Lord you can't buy them you know it's old friends after all And when the house is empty Lights begin to fade And there's nothing to protect you Except the window shade It's hard to put your finger on The thing that scares you most Cause you don't know the difference Between an angel and a ghost Old friends Shine like diamonds Old friends You can always call old friends Lord you can't buy them you know it's old friends after all It's, uh, I never know what's going to happen, so believe this stuff surprises me as much as it might anybody else. Um, so, you know, like I was saying, getting this bass was something that was just completely self-indulgent, my little, you know, fantasy that somehow this bass would speak. And uh, what I learned from that was, you know, if you stop listening to that voice inside, it will stop talking. And I've been very fortunate to 
get to uh, play on a lot of great records. I've had a, a wonderful uh, time. I, I'll tell you a quick funny story about the Chieftains. You guys ever heard, heard of the Chieftains, the Irish group? I, I got to record with them with Emmy Lou Harris one day, and, and we cut the song we were supposed to cut, and I was playing this, and then, and then we were going to do another song, and Patty Maloney, you know, the little teeny guy, and he goes, uh, do you have a bow? And I'm like, uh, no, actually, I don't. And, he, and I said, but I got this thing that I've been doing that maybe might work for that. And, and all I did was something that I had discovered from working with steel guitar players and also with songwriters who had terrible time, uh, tempo-wise. And, and so I, I just did this. And he goes, that's just what I was hearing in my head. And it was the most awesome moment for me. I just, it really made me feel good. Uh, but I want to talk just briefly about what I call the three T's. I actually wrote a column for Bass Player many years ago about this. Time, tone, and taste is where the bass player really has a lot more control than we realize sometimes. And certainly in a band with no drums, you are the time. But even in a band where there is drums, and there's a drummer who thinks he's all that, which some of them do. Unlike us, we're like, we're share, sharing people, you know. And uh, you can really control how things go, and, and you have a lot of power. Uh, and so you have to use that with discretion, but you know, you got somebody's Russian, somebody's dragon, it's right here in the middle, and you can bring them there. And it's become kind of a metaphor for my whole, my whole life has been trying to bring people from both sides into the middle. So that's time, tone is really important because you've got to be in context with what's going on or just be aware of what's going on around you and not be in your own little vacuum of, man, this, this was an awesome tone for that rock and roll thing we cut two weeks ago when that's not what's happening today. And so I think that's, that's a big part of it. And there's a lot of things you can do with tone that you, know, you can just do with your hands. You, know, you don't have to buy another piece of gear. I mean, gear is awesome, but there are many, many ways to change your sound. You can do it with you know, by uh, using a pick. You can do it by using a pick and muting. Um, you know, so many things you can do to, to change that. So it's just a question of not saying, it's not a one size fits all. Tone is something where you're trying to make it work because as we were, as the guys in the previous clinic, we were talking about metal and you can never hear the bass in metal music. And it's like, well, because maybe it's the wrong tone. You want, my goal when, in my studio career was to give an engineer a tone that he would turn up so that when I heard it on the radio or heard it on the record, I could he actually hear myself. And uh, I seem to work a lot with singers who work down in a low register, Don Williams, Keith Whitley, singers like that. And so it's really important to fit that. And, and so tone is incredibly important. But what brings it all together is um, taste. That's application. That's how you take these tools and you make it work and you, and you go, you know, I could play something right there, but, I, but I'm not gonna. And Don Williams, who I worked with for many, many years, who just passed away a couple months ago, um, Don gave me the best piece of musical advice I ever got. I'd been in his band for maybe six months or so and, and most of his music, his particular feel was... It's like, okay, there's not much to that, right? But other songs had a little more, and I'd play a little bit, and he, you know, I'd try some things, do some different things, and he would, and, and Don, he says, David, you don't have to play what's on the record. Just don't throw me off. And it was an incredible piece of advice, because it's like, don't interrupt your buddy when he's telling you a story. You know, it's just like, you can be creative. There, he left the door open for me to be creative, but it's like, you know, pay attention. You know, it's not all about you all the time. I mean, we all want it to be about us all the time. But as bass players, you know, you got to pay attention. So that was that was a really uh, a good thing. Um, so over the years, I got more, you know, after the bass player song came into my life, I'm like, okay, well, what am I just going to play this one song forever? i got to actually have some more material. So I started writing some stuff, uh, some different instrumentals, and I started looking for songs from other people that might apply. And uh, so... You know, when the Beatles got off the road, said no more concerts, we're going to make records so we don't have to, you know, we don't have to do anything that, you know, we, we don't have to worry about playing it on stage. So, of course, in my 
Ridiculous Mind, I thought, well, perfect. I'll get one of those songs that they never, ever had to think about playing on stage, and I'll do it with solo bass. That'll make sense. And, and <laughs> you know, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Uh, so I did, uh, I recorded this song, and it actually became the title track of, of my second solo record. And uh, I should mention, uh, we'll get to the whole history of my fabulous record label and stuff, but we do have some merch over there. Uh, I don't want to take it back to Tennessee, so we're blowing out CDs, and uh, there's one D the DVD of the day the bass players took over the world from 96. Uh, mm -hmm. Blowing everything out for 10 bucks a pop, So, and it's the honor system. If you need to leave, just throw some money on the table. It's fine. If you need to steal it because you don't have the money, that's okay, too. But anyway, so this is a, a, a just kind of a, an idea, and I should talk a little bit about effects. Uh, I've, I've always loved Boss Effects. Uh, they do really great work, um, and... A guy named Larry Cheney, who was a great guitar player, still is, uh, lives uh, down in Texas now in uh, Dripping Springs. He plays with a guy named Edwin McCain. But Larry was in a band with me for a long time, and he was the king of getting inside those boxes and making them do crazy stuff that they would never, you'd never think. He'd be like, what's that sound like, the sun exploding? Oh, it's a guitar, you know. What's that sound like, you know, uh, whales, you know, skiing? Oh, that's a guitar, you know. It's just, and so I'm always, uh, I got to give Larry, give Larry some love there. And, uh, oh yeah, cause I, yeah. and so, so here I am trying to be the Beatles all by myself. Silly man. But what are you going to do? Let's see. Right? We're going to do that. And that. And we're going to do this. For me, you know, stomp boxes are great, but what I like about multi-effects is you can program them and it's there. You know, it's not like, oh my God, who turned the drive knob up? You know, it's, it, it, to me, it's more liberating than, than restricting. So, uh, and here we go. This is from the album Revolver, the Beatles. Uh, I wasn't on that one. Turn off your mind, relax and float downstream It is not dying It is not dying Lay down all thoughts, surrender to the void It is shining It is shining that you may see the meaning of within It is being It is being And love is all and love is everyone It is knowing It is knowing Yeah Listen to the color of your dreams. It is not living. It is not living. Or play the game existence to the end of the beginning. Of the beginning. Yeah. Turn off your mind Turn off your mind Oh yeah, yeah Thank you. 
your mind Yeah, thank you. So, kind of silly. Uh, so we can go to outer space and back, but now it's time for a little reality check. Uh, taking care of business is not uncool. It's called being professional. And if you allow yourself to be taken advantage of, there's plenty of people who will line up to take your stuff and make money off of it and take you to the cleaners. Uh, I joined AFM, Local 257 in Nashville, 40 years ago today. And it's been a very interesting journey. The union has been great to me. And, and I, as I got uh, you know, uh, more and more involved, I began to see that value. And you know, we all deal with this thing that I, I call, I think I wrote a column about this in Bass Player too, called Art versus commerce, where you know you got to make a living, you got to survive, and people come and ask me for a lot of advice, and I say, you know, if you have some other way you can make a living that doesn't kill your soul, you can make different musical choices, and maybe it will open up a door to something that if you're just going hand to mouth, gig to gig, it may not happen. You know, I never really understood uh, the value of that until we played a big show in Giant Stadium and. I played Giant Stadium, man, I was happy as hell. But they filmed it, and about a month later, someone goes, hey man, you're on TV, and it's like, what? And, I, and it was a Casey Kasem, America's Top 40, and we were on, uh, they took a song from Don Williams' concert that was at the time the number one country single, and it aired once in December of 1980 and once in January of 1981. And I made $2,000 and got two years worth of health insurance for my family from that one gig that I'd already been paid for. So it was really, uh, you know, that was the beginning of my awareness uh, of, of what the union does. And so, you know, I kind of made it up as I went along. I was a band guy. All I ever knew was I wanted to be in a band. I didn't know what a sideman was. I didn't know what a touring guy was. And so as I gradually, I got into touring with Don Williams, and then Don gave me some opportunities to play on his records. I started doing demo sessions with anybody who would call me, and then it eventually led uh, to playing on a, a lot of records. I don't know, somebody somewhere counted it's 500 some maybe um but you know my i mean that was my dream you know i didn't i didn't even really know it was an achievable dream and so it just kind of kept moving i learned about songwriting i learned about how to once i learned how to make records i started trying to produce and starting doing my own stuff which led to earwave records in 1989 it, yes i was a visionary no not really i was just wanting to get this music out i i didn't know that independent labels were going to be cool like 25 years later i was just doing what i needed to do to get this stuff out of my system <laughs> to be honest so i i was been very fortunate to do that and i've got a bunch of uh uh, we've released 15 projects on Earwave over the years. We've got two films and uh, 13 albums. And uh, it, it's been a real blessing to get to do that. Um, my new record is called Angel in the Ashes. Um, oh, I have it right here in my pocket. Wow, how about that? Because <laughs> I didn't run into the guy I was looking for to give that to. But uh, regardless. Um, so I'm going to play you the title song from this. And, and uh, this is a song I wrote with my friend Ben Silas. He came to me with the idea. I had a house fire in 2009. I lost a bunch of bases. Uh, luckily, a lot of them were not lost, including this. I have a bunch that have crispy headstocks, but they survived. I lost my dog in the fire. That was tough. Oh, that was the worst part. But what I discovered, and I, I can't help it. I'm going to get emotional here. You know, it was such, not just Nash, Nashville is an amazing town, but I think this would happen to anyone anywhere. You know, people come to your rescue. People I barely even knew were calling me up and going, man, do you need a place to live? Do you need another base? What do you need? What can I do to help? It was in, an incredible cathartic experience. And so uh, with my friend Ben Silas, we wrote a song about it, and I'm going to play it for you now, and uh, hopefully I won't, like, break down in the middle. <laughs> it could happen. So... We just, uh, we sat down and wrote it, and I had to live with it for a while before I could really uh, kind of come to terms with, uh, you know, because I've written a lot of songs, but I rarely, if ever, 
rarely if ever write personal stuff because, you know, I was always more, let's create an imaginary scenario about this guy and his girl and all that. And that was a lot easier for me than actually writing about myself and, and my emotions and stuff. So uh, I learned a lot from that whole process. And uh, I would not wish it on my worst enemy, but I really did learn an awful lot about what life is really about. So uh, this is called Angel in the Ashes. After the fire, life begins again. That's when you find out who really are your friends. Starting over, pushing back the fear. Out in the darkness, a shining light appears. And the smoke begins to clear. There's an angel in the ashes. A phoenix rising up And everything happens for a reason To teach us how to love To teach us how to love There's a chapter in everybody's book when second chances make you take a closer look when you feel broken and you're losing faith don't stop believing that help is on the way it's getting closer every day there's an angel in the ashes A phoenix rising up And everything happens for a reason To teach us how to love To teach us how to love clear blue sky it can all burn down 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 don't waste time wondering why look up from the ground take a look around cause there's an angel in the ashes Phoenix rising up And everything happens for a reason To teach us how to love There's an angel in the ashes Angel in the ashes A phoenix rising up Rising up and everything happens for a reason To teach us how to love To teach us how to love There's an angel in the ashes Woo! Yeah, that's that my song. That, that song is my way of saying, "Hey, you know, there's no law that says you have to be a guitar player or a piano player to be a singer-songwriter. Why the hell can't you strum a bass like a guitar once in a while?" So, and and my three solo records, just uh, so you know, every note except my voice on those records is all bass parts doing silly things that would get you fired if I wasn't the boss, uh, you know. And I am the boss of my gig anyway. Uh, so.
uh, I, I just think it's, it's really important to just remember that, you know, it, it's great to play a lot of notes, but sometimes the power of simplicity is, 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 is where it's at, and it's playing the song, you know. That particular song is very layered on the record with a bunch of sitar basses and really wild stuff, but it's nice to just be able to play something without the gimmicks so much, uh, always. Um, so I want to give a shout out, I must give a shout out to GHS Strings. Uh, I've been playing them for many, many years. I use a lot of different kinds. Uh, I love the pressure wound strings. Um, I use those on a lot of my fretless uh, basses and, and really that's kind of my go-to string. Uh, this guy has had bright flats. The only strings that have ever been on that bass are GHS bright flats. Um, these are some new strings they're making, they call Balanced, where uh, John there, who's kind of a little whiz kid, uh, came up with a thing where it has something to do with the size of the cores and all the stuff I don't understand. All I know is I put them on here and went, yeah. <laughs> you know, and uh, so I lo love GHS and uh, also want to thank uh, Jeff Gensler and Gensler Amplification uh, for this really cool rig here. How tiny is that? Uh, he, uh, he's a really good guy and makes really good stuff. And because I'm doing all these other things, I'm not looking for color from the amp. I'm looking for reality and flat and, and, um, and a sweet top end. And he's doing, it, this is called the 10-2 where it has a 10 inch speaker and then it's got four two inches. And it's just a really nice, it's sort of like a play on the Bose thing, but you have the oomph that you don't always get if you have 8,000 small speakers. Uh, so I appreciate that. And, and um, normally I use this, and then there's one called the 12.3 that has a 12 and some 3 inches, but it got damaged on the way out here, so it didn't make it. Uh, but, but it's a great little rig. Um, so with all these, you know, I get down in my basement, and I hook all this stuff up, and I, you know, I call it the rabbit hole. And get down here and fool around with stuff. And I came up, you know, every now and then I'll be supposed to be rehearsing something else and I'll get something going like, wow, that's kind of cool. What's that? Hey, let's do that. Whoa, whoa. And next thing I know, it's this whole thing. And so, and I would press save and then forget about it. And so when I was making this record, I went back and I realized I had like 15 of these things that are just sort of spontaneous moments. And so um, I put three of them on the record and I called them bass scapes because they are kind of, they're like almost like between the lyrical songs, they're like palate cleansers kind of spacey, kind of trippy. And uh, this next one I'm going to play for you is, um, is called Pendulum. And the idea, of course, naming instrumental songs is really fun because you could call it whatever you want. You know, <laughs> it's not like, yeah, where's the hook? You know, I, I didn't hear that in the chorus. It's like, so I call this Pendulum with the idea being that, you know, in this world that we're in, especially these days, things tend to go from one side to the other. And then it comes back, and you get this thing. And, the, and as we say, as bass players say, the truth is in the middle. So that's the idea. So as that pendulum swings, you just try to hang on to that middle, that middle bit when it comes. So that's the idea of that. And it was really inspired by uh, some of the sounds uh, that I stumbled on uh, with this. And it was really interesting because I had recorded it. I don't even, you know, when you save it, it doesn't have a date like it does on a computer. So uh, this one, when this one popped up, I went, wow, i got to do something with this. And it was really inspired by this, uh, this one, this crazy sound. It's like, hmm, yeah, what can we do with that? So I did some stuff with that, and it's like this. Oop, oop, no, not yet. We have to push the right buttons in the right order. I hate when I do that. Yeah, thank you, let's try that again. <laughs> Come on, baby. Here we go. Whoop, that's not gonna work. One more time. Oh, come on. Okay. Thank you. 
short one for you here. Oops, sorry. I call this my life story in two and a half minutes. Uh, I finally, after years of wondering what it could possibly be, I finally wrote a sequel to the day the bass players took over the world. And uh, this is dedicated to all the women that I've annoyed over the years. Uh, oh, I'm happy now, I will say, but that's another matter. And it goes kind of like, uh, let me get a little better sound here. I got a date with a bass. I won't be coming over to your place. There's a melody I'm trying to chase. I got a date with a bass. Yes, I know that it's late. And I promised I'd be there by eight. I'm really sorry that I made you wait. 
I had a date with a bass, just me and my bass. I guess I'm a little strange, cause from an early age, I've been in love with that sound so big and round and so low down. I got a date with a bass. I'm sorry I won't see your pretty face. Nothing but this could ever take your place. I got a date with a bass, just me and my bass. It might be hard to understand, but I'm a simple man. And I'm gonna lose my mind if I don't give my fingers enough time. They got a date with a bass. Don't think that I'm a player just cause I'm playing. It ain't the same thing, babe, I'm really playing. I'm just saying, I got a date with a bass. I won't be coming over to your place. See, there's this melody I'm trying to trace. I got a date with a bass. Just me and my bass, a date with a bass, just me and my bass, just me and my bass. All right. Well, we're running out of time here, so I'm just going to leave you with a couple of thoughts. Uh, the Musicians Union is a great organization. It's been around for 120 years, the Nashville branch for 115 years. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's all we got, and a bunch of us have gotten together over the last decade and tried to make things better. About nine years ago, I got elected president of the Nashville chapter of AFM 257, and uh, it's kind of started a revolution that spread to New York, and then in 2010, we voted out the president, vice president, four to five board members, because they just were not taking care of business. They were taxing us without giving us a voice in what our money was being used for, and so... When we took office, uh, the year before, we were a million dollars in the red and headed for the trash can. And uh, in less than two years, we were a million dollars in the black. We've come up with a lot of new things. Um, we came up with, in Nashville that became a national scale. We actually have a home recording scale. It's the only scale in the AFM that is by the song and not, um, and not by the hour. And you can negotiate your own rate depending on supply and demand, $100 a song minimum, all the benefits, pension, health and welfare, it's all built into that round number. All you got to do is send somebody a contract and let them put an X on a PDF, and then your work is protected. I've uh, been to Washington twice, testified in front of Congress about intellectual property. You guys may not be aware that AMFM radio is, is hardly any, the only countries in the world that don't pay royalties to the, the artists and musicians on, on AMFM radio. Radios. The only other countries are North Korea, Rwanda, Iran, and China, and us. And so we've been trying to overcome that for a long time. Uh, we're working on some things. I call it the big umbrella, where we get everybody in the industry together, all the different branches, even the people who say they don't like each other. And we work our deal and then take our deal to Congress. But as long as we're going to Congress with four different deals, for one for the songwriters, one for the producers, it's not going to work. I grew up around D.C. I know it's not going to so we've been working on that really hard. Uh, there's some good things on the horizon with that. Um, my second favorite thing in the world is getting musicians paid. Um, I'll tell you a really quick story. Patsy Cline record, Back in Baby's Arms, got used by Mazda for about a year-long commercial campaign. I'm watching football, and I see it three times, and I go, that ain't a sound alike. That's the real record. So we submitted a form. Record was cut on September 10th, 1962. And about six months ago, an 89-year-old violin player named Soli Fott came in to pick up his check. And it was one of the happiest days of my life to see this guy come in. And he told me some great stories, and we took a picture of him with his check. They got paid $57.33 in 1962, 
and they made about 10, more than 10 times that. Because when a song gets used in a commercial, they pay today's rates, not 50 year ago rates. So that's a good thing. I'm gonna do a short, do I got time for one shorty? Okay, it's kind of short. <laughs> Can I go to the bathroom, teacher? <laughs> Uh, so on on this record, and uh, you know, and and uh, I don't want to get too uh, too too heavy with my um, begging and pleading to sell product, but we do have some there. It's ten bucks pop if you want, but if not, you can go to DavePomeroy.com. There's a lot of stuff. If anybody goes and buys my, um, anybody goes and, and and buys anything online, uh, especially the new album, send me an email and I'll send you the liner notes because we're really the artwork on the new album is something I'm very proud of. And personally, I grew up in the age of album covers, so. Uh, anyway, so one of the songs on here is called Ball of Money in the Cloud. And it's a medley of three songs from the 70s. This is the last tune. Cool? We good? Four minutes? Three minutes? Okay. The guys that were talking went more than five minutes over. <laughs> um, so I'll do you a nice short version of the third of the three songs. It's about, uh, this, this particular song has 41 tracks of bass on it and 10 vocal tracks. Um, and this is, uh, whoa, no it didn't, not yet. Um, this is uh, Bob Babbitt played bass on the original and uh, it's a medley of Ball of Confusion and For the Love of Money, Anthony Jackson, one of the few times that a session player got a co-write on a song because he came up with the line. Uh, so this is the third of those three tunes, Cloud Nine. It's Bob Babbitt again one more time. And we'll do a real super short version for whoever that dude is because he looks very official. He did leave, though. He's gone. Shh. Well, I can't do that. You don't have time for that. All right, here we go. Thank, thank you all for listening. Uh, Chris, thank you for allowing me to be part of this. It's, it's a wonderful uh, event, and I'm just tickled to death to be here. All right, here we go. Childhood part of my life wasn't very pretty. See, I was born and raised in the streets of the city. On a one-room shack with ten other children beside me. We hardly had enough food or room to sleep. It was hard times, and I needed something to ease my worried mind. My daddy didn't know the meaning of work. He disrespected mama and treated us like dirt. I left home seeking a job that I never did find. Depressed and downhearted, I took to cloud nine. I'm doing fine up here on cloud nine. One more time, I'm doing fine up here on cloud nine. Folks down to tell me, they say, give yourself a chance and don't let life pass you by. Cause the world around you's a rat race and only the strong survive It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world and it ain't no lie It ain't even safe no more to walk the streets at night I'm doing fine up here on cloud nine Let me tell you about cloud nine You're as free as a bird in flight Ain't no difference between day and night it's a world of love and harmony You're a million miles from reality Reality I wanna stay higher Wanna stay higher Up and away Thank mm -hmm. you.
live the life I love I'm gonna love the life I live up here on cloud nine I'm riding high I'm riding high up here on cloud nine <laughs> thank you all all the way from Nashville Dave Pomeroy All right, see you guys around. Thank you.